Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. With me today is Thaddeus Barsati, who is the co-CEO at Field True. Thaddeus, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. Well, excited to to learn more here. Um, but why don't we start at the beginning? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, and, and about Field True. Sure. Yeah. So I grew up on a very small organic farm in the Cape Bay Valley, which is in uh, just west of Sacramento in Yolo County. And I have three brothers, two, two older brothers who were twins, Noah and Che, and a younger brother, Freeman. And our parents, uh, Martin and Kathleen, were graduate students at UC Davis in the 70s. And they were part of the movement of folks who really wanted to see clean food production, you know, come back. We'd largely lost a lot of, you know, post-World War II, there are a lot of new tools, a lot of fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides being used. And so they were part of that movement movement that wanted to see some clean food. So they put their money where their mouths were, picked up, moved out to a very small community, Cape Bay, and farmed whatever they possibly could with the seasons. So in the spring, we had you know, mixed vegetables and not a really great selection. And then we had some peaches in the summer and the whole summer was always fun. Lots of tomatoes and melons, and peppers, and the fall vegetables came in, um, kales and chards and carrots, and all those things. And the winter we had, you know, butternut squash and leeks and things like that. And so my childhood was hustling produce at farmer's markets and teaching people what organic was, you know, when I was a kid, that was a new thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's organic before organic was cool, right? Yeah. We were <laughs> organic before it was cool. And at, at one time my older brother, Che was t- talking to someone at mar- market said, Hey, try this melon. It's organic. And it was a professor. And he said, son, we're all organic making a reference <laughs> to being carbon, carbon based creatures. <laughs> so yeah, that was our childhood. But then uh, my parent, mom got sick, you know, sad chapter in her life. She got breast cancer and, made some changes, including um, separating from my father. And she bought the company. It was a very you know, small farm, 40, 50 acres, 300 people, CSA, Farm Fresh U. And, and then she passed away in 2000. So my brothers and I took over the, the business in 2000 while we were going to college and kind of figuring out our lives and started, get, got, got better at selling the produce, brought some smart people in, including you know, some of our wives and farm fresh shoe got bigger, started a technology company to, to keep up with it, kept the farm going. And so here we are today. Uh, Field true is the holding company that owns farm fresh shoe, which services California and field true also owns full circle, which services Pacific Northwest, the same idea, you know, delivering a local philosophy of produce. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit there about what was the technology that you guys were creating? Was it uh, some customer facing technology so that they could, you know, transact with you or were these more, you know, back farm systems, can't use really back office here, but systems to help you guys kind of manage the farm and, and delivery of your product? Yeah, that's a good question. So from the beginning, the, the concept of what we were delivering hadn't changed. You know, mom was going to deliver a good selection the best selection of local produce delivered to people's doors and the way that on a frequency that they picked and they could pick items that they didn't want in their box. So if someone really didn't want, you know, zucchini as an example, they were marked as a no zucchini customer. And then when zucchini was scheduled to go in the box, we would pull the zucchini out and put in peppers or something. And that was all done in um, binders with paper. So we had these binders and there was a paper for each customer and when we do scheduling, we'd look at the customer and see if they were a, a weekly customer or every other week customer, or once a month customer, and then we'd circle the delivery dates. And, and that was the beginning of the system. So the first system you know, we built replaced that. And then we started making more promises like, well, we'll we could put your box here, or we could do this, or we could keep a key, or, oh, you don't want something. And we couldn't keep track of all these promises we were making. And so our business, the first spurt of growth in our business was once we built a system that could keep track of all this stuff and like make it easy to customize the schedule, um, keep track of what we said we would do. And then it just grew from there. 
it wasn't until the I think the third version. Uh, then this that's the second version. The third version we started to let people go online and make these changes themselves. Mm-hmm. And that was we were still in FileMaker Pro at that time, and uh, the system could handle maybe a dozen people online at a time. And uh-huh. so we would crash it every time people, you know, were doing what we're asking them to do. And so I then heard FileMaker Pro in a while. That, that, that's <laughs> right. a good one. <laughs> So then um, a lot of our business really took off once we built this solution that we call Brandywine and that was scalable. We could have all our customers on, people could start to, you know, we'd make our first stab at what the best local selection was, but, but customers would go on about 70 to 80% of our customers do this now and they customize their box. They say, Hey, I want more carrots. I hate the bok choy fad. If you send me another piece of bok choy, I'm going to murder you. And, and then we, you know, added milk and groceries. So we have about a thousand um, local artisan products that people can add to their boxes. Okay. Yeah. What's uh, so obviously the whole concept of CSA is around staying local and keeping local and people wanting to buy local. Um, How are you controlling what areas you're able to serve? Right. Um, there's probably geographic areas as you're letting customers go online and do some of these things. How, how are you able to kind of ring fence that into the areas that you can actually serve? Yeah, that's a good question. It's um, so we really do the food system from the, from the field all the way to the door of our customer. And so we have repack facilities, three of them on the West coast, Los Angeles, Northern California and Seattle. And each one of those has its own menu of what's most local. And what limits where we can deliver is can we get a box packed from that location and deliver to the customer effectively? So we're not using, you know, tr- traditional third-party carriers like UPS, FedEx, USPS that our product can't make that work. It's very fragile, perishable. Our customers don't want a lot of packaging. So our system is, you know, we pack boxes and then we'll move them to a, a hub. And then from there, the last mile, driver will pick that up and deliver it to someone's door. And that's really the limiting factor is like, are they close enough? And can we get enough customers in that area, you know, to justify an effective delivery route? Well, that's still got to be a challenge because even if you talk about LA, since I know it a little bit better, but you know, if you've got a lot of customers in, you know, Hollywood and Santa Monica, and then somebody says that, you know, one person signs up over here in Riverside, I mean, you know, there, there's some efficiencies there. So it's got to be as much of an art as it is a science to try to figuring that out, right? Yeah, I mean, we're business minded folks. And so the, you know, making money, I guess, can be an art, we try to treat it like a science. <laughs> and I think, you know, part of the thing is, with a subscription is you're selling, at least our company, we're, you know, we're selling an idea a set of values. And with that, we're able to ask maybe a little bit more for our customers from our customers. Okay. You know, you need to commit, please commit to this. Um, hey, we can't deliver to you whenever you want. You know, we have to deliver. We're only in your area on this day. Okay. And we have a lot yeah. of these constraints um, that deliver that efficiency that you're talking about. But our, our yeah. company's never been like, hey, gross sales are the key. Let's just grow the top line and everything's going to work out because you could lose a lot of money doing that. When you know, look around, there's a lot of companies that have done that. It hasn't worked out for them. So we really focus on you know, financial sustainability is a key to taking care of local agriculture. I think there's a fundamental difference from the consumer's perspective in signing up for your product or CSA in general versus, you know, the meal delivery kit services or something like that, where once I sign up for it, I just expect it to show up and it's going to have these things in it. Like there, there, there is much subscribing to an idea um, and, and, and eating local and, and, you know, getting things hand delivered than they, as much as they are wanting the product itself, right. They could go to the local grocery store and pick up a lot of these things, but they, it's, it's, it's as much about that concept. So I would think that would lend some flexibility, you know, from their perspective into, uh, working with you to say, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take the delivery on Tuesdays instead of Thursdays or, you know, whatever. Um, but how do you guys then manage through that when, so you can't just have a customer come up to your website type in their address and then, you know, I'm going to get it on Tuesday. Like walk us through that process. How does it typically work? Yeah. So if you go to our website, 
which is farmfreshq.com in California and fullcircle.com in the Pacific Northwest, it's going to ask for your zip code and you put in your zip code and then it's going to say, Hey Nick, we're in your area on Tuesdays. Yeah. And you say, okay, well that some of our areas will offer multiple delivery days. Um, not, not many, but it's something we're trying. And then they say, okay, okay you click yes. And then you get, you're, you're in the system. And on Thursday afternoon, we have decided what the best local selection is. We call it the menu. What's the menu this week? And based on the service you've selected, hey, I want a regular box. And we say, great, well, here's, here's the 13 items or 10 items that we think is the best local selection for the week. And then you go on, let's say you're getting Tuesday delivery. Well, on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, or Sunday, you log into your account and you go and you see the mix that we've set up for you. And then you also see the 70 to 100 other uh, local produce items. And you can mix and match your box. And then you move to the next step where you can add grocery items and, and things like that. And then your order is complete. And then we're keeping track of all that in the background. And then when we go to pack your box, our system's all integrated. We then route like, okay, what's the best way to deliver all of these boxes? And we come up the route and we actually pack mm -hmm. the boxes in reverse order from which they'll be delivered so that when they go into the van or to whatever the ultimate delivery vehicle is, it's organized and that delivery driver has their phone, which has an app, our app on it. And then they just run around and deliver it at night. Yeah. Awesome. That's how so it works. So in that, in that experience, um, are, so are when they're signing up for the CSA, like the, the curated local box of, of produce, is that a fixed amount that they're paying for that? And then if they add in other local, they're, you know, potentially adding more to their cart, so to speak, and potentially be paying more. Yes, exactly. So when you, when you sign up, you're picking um, a box size and then we have a set amount and we say, Hey, this is how much it's going to be um, per week or per delivery. And that's a minimum. And you have to, you know, you could do nothing and we'll send you that box with the best local, local selection. If you're traveling, you could say, hey, I want to cancel the delivery or push it off. But then, yes, when you start to do that customizing or adding things, then the price builds up from there. And there's no delivery fee. So we've figured out in that, in that core service that pays for the produce and, and kind of gets the box to your door mm -hmm. with no additional fees. So what do you see in terms of what percentage of customers switch out something in their, in their CSA box? And then what percentage of customers are also, you know, picking some other things off of the shelf and adding them to their basket? Yeah. The, the vast majority of our customers customize their box, you know, but, you know, 80% minimum could be higher. I, I used to know that number. And, but the thing that I think is um, more interesting, I mean, that's a great number, but most of them do it on Thursday. So no matter when they're getting their box, they've kind of, you know, developed a relationship with us and the service where they know, hey, Thursday, Thursday is when next week's selection is figured out. And they go and they do their customization on Thursday. And I think, you know, part of that is, you know, we accept customers are never going to get all of their food from us. But our request is that we get the first shot at it. And yeah. I think when they do go and do that process on Thursday or Friday or whenever they do it, they're also thinking about, oh, okay, great. Where am I going to get the rest of my food this week? Am I going to go to the farmer's market? Am I going to stop at the grocery store I like? Or, you know, what do I need to get or not need to get? And so, it, you know, we kind of fit into that, that ecosystem with the, the customer's lifestyle that way. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I know a trip's being made to my house already, right? Because mm -hmm. I've subscribed to the box. Here's my opportunity to, and as you guys keep adding more selection to that, are you seeing more and more of like uptake and, and where, where do you see that going, right? You become a full-fledged grocery store at, at some point, right? Sure. Yeah. So it's been an interesting, interesting um, evolution. When we took over the business, we only delivered produce. That was it. It was just uh, produce and, and we customized and we, and we built this business around being the people that got you good local produce. And then we added, started adding things. I think eggs was maybe the first thing we added and we added a little stuff here and there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but before the pandemic, it was hard to get our customers to really adopt the use of our service for anything beyond produce. 
So it was maybe you know, less than 10% of our sales was coming from non-produce items. And during the pandemic, that changed. Suddenly, like, you could, we could sell anything. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I remember knowing the pandemic was a real thing because we were sold out of uh-huh. Radicchio. And I thought, how on earth can we be sold out of Radicchio? Anyway, uh-huh. and now, now our customers, you know, have seen that we can do that and they like the selection. You know, we're not just putting any brand out there. They have to have attributes that agree with our philosophy. And it's, you know, more than 10% of our business now. You know, where does that stop? We don't want to be a full-fledged grocery store. That's not who we are. Um, our goal is to offer, you know, a few items that are best in class for, you know, the local artisan, better for you consumer who wants to, you know, keep their food system small and connected to their farmer. Are we ever going to deliver paper plates? No, like that's just not who we are, nor is it who we want to be. Okay. Well, talk about marketing for for a second. I mean, I, I'm assuming word of mouth is probably the biggest way that you acquire new customers. You know, people being satisfied with the service, telling their their family, their friends about it. But what other outreach do you guys do to try to reach other consumers in the areas that you're serving? I mean, we've tried everything. Um, the, the things that we still do, meaning we've seen some level of success with them, is obviously you know online presence. Whether that's being at the top of the list when you search something similar to what we're looking for or what our company is, or social media, and then uh, we'll do mailers, and then we have um, a dedicated sales force that focuses on one-on-one interactions, which could be made at. It could be made at the door. It could be made at events. So just having a conversation with people about our farm, local local food system, what's important to them, why you know why it matters to let professionals like us curate a mix each week is also a big part of what we do. Well, I, I got to think too. I mean, California compared to a lot of other parts of the country. There's, there's definitely a focus there more on organic, eating healthy, um, you know, kind of being connected to, I mean, farming being such a massive industry in California. I mean, there's there's just better awareness there, right? Um, have you seen that be similar in like the Pacific Northwest where you guys also operate? Yeah, I mean, all of our customers, well, the thing our customers have most in common is they're a relatively educated group of folks. And so when we look at, well, who's most likely to be our customers? you know, income or education. People that have a higher level of education tend to be people to understand what we're doing. Um, I think the, I think if anything, the produce, the abundance of produce on the West Coast makes it a little more difficult for us. And I think that might sound silly, but before the organic foods movement, the grocery stores really weren't that good in produce or before Whole Foods. And so there was this little golden area of time when we were organic and our produce selection was just so much better than what could be found in the grocery store. And I think that it was really easy for us to sell our services then. And today, people definitely know who we are. We're not having to explain very much. You know, most people have some idea of what we are or have some idea of you know, the abundance of, of produce available on the West Coast how much that goes into deciding to be part of our service or not. But I don't really understand that. I suspect I've always had this theory that you could do our business nationally and go to other places and maybe even places that don't have this abundance of, of fresh fruits and vegetables. And I think that could be a, a benefit. Mm-hmm. You know, what happened with, California and Arizona being so good at producing food coupled with our ability to refrigerate it and transport it is that really put a lot of the local fresh fruit and vegetable growers around the nation out of business because these retailers you know we're looking for a year-round solution to things and so they would say hey I need you know I need a thousand cases of lettuce a week and California and Arizona were able to say, hey, 
I can give you a thousand cases a week, 52 weeks a year. I'll even set the price. It just shows up at your DC. And now what happens when you have that, those three or six really good months of local production in the summertime, it's not like the retailers are stopping and saying, okay, wait, stop California. We're, we're moving to our local selection. So I feel like a lot of the nation is being a little more starved from good produce than they used to be. And, you know, before World War II, Michigan was the number two fresh produce state, really? production state. Like there was all kinds of great mm -hmm. um, production that happened up there. And it really kind of got taken out by how, how cheap California could get it done. Yeah. It's really did one, one question I want to ask you. I mean, agriculture has, is kind of known to be slow to adopt technology, let alone build its own. Um, you guys have obviously put a lot of time and effort into building something that's very specific to your business and managing it, but kind of to what you were just saying, there's others around the country who have these same problems, right? There's CSAs here in Tennessee where I live. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've been involved in those before and a lot of them are very small, probably don't have the time or resources to, to do this sort of thing. Have you thought about white labeling, what you've put all of this time and effort into and, and, you know, taking that technology outside of, uh, the West coast? <clears throat> Yeah, we have, and it's a continued um, discussion. The challenge with that that we've learned is people have their specific ways of doing stuff. And our software was built around our specific way of doing things. You know, we didn't build software and then run a farm and a, and a warehouse and delivery. We were doing all that, and then we took we made software work for us. So yeah. when you go to another CSA, and I've had many of these conversations, typically what tends to happen is people get caught up with the fact that our system is just different enough from how they do it. They're like, well, can you tip drivers? No, not yet. Oh, that's a problem. Oh, can you offer deliveries any day? No. What about group deliveries? We're like, oh, we, you know, that's not a big part of what we do. So there's there ends up being this list of things that make it not work. And the effort into, you know, being a software as a service is a very different business and that's not our business. And so, yes, there is potential for that, but we haven't, you know, decided to make the time and resources available to really dive into it, but it is an interesting well, opportunity. Yeah. And one thing I will say about that is too often those that are developing SaaS for a particular industry or vertical will go out into, you know, they'll, they'll go into a closed door room and they'll develop the software that they say that industry needs, right? And they have, they never eat their own dog food, right? They have no, they have no need to. So they're trying to dictate to this market what they want and need. And then they go out there and usually because there's no alternative, people try it and then, you know, they kind of <clears throat> learn to live with it or, you know, the platform evolves from there. You guys have done the exact opposite of that. You know, you are building something that is made for the real world, albeit a very spe specific example of the real world, but you know it works in the real world because you you live with it every day. And I think to a large degree that would resonate with others who are like, yeah, I, I, but I know it works because there's a very successful business here that's already using it. I mean, they built it for themselves. So I don't know, definitely definitely something that could be pretty interesting. I, I can't disagree with you. And, and, you know, running a business, there's always you know, there's an unlimited amount of things you can do. And, course, and so right. ultimately you you look at, well, what, how, how are we going to spend our time and resources? And, um, you know, the, the national thing is something I'm interested in. You know, we, we expanded to the Northwest. We, we recently added Las Vegas. Um, so I, I look forward to exploring that in the future. Um, I want to ask you about pricing. Um, you know, when you guys look at just the CSA component of it, right, you're, you're effectively asking uh, a customer to subscribe in advance for something they're going to be, you know, getting in the future. And so you're having to predict, all right, well, this is what we're going to grow. This is what it's going to take. And you're factoring in, of course, all of your costs. But what, what goes into that for you guys? Or, you know, there's a lot of talk about in subscriptions, value-based pricing, which is, you know, what value does my customer get out of it? Oftentimes, agriculture takes the exact opposite bottoms up approach, you know, adds up all of my costs, adds a little bit of margin on top. Um, and, and that's how they set the price. But well, how do you guys approach it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a challenging question. I think the key to it is 
valuing what you're going to pay the growers fairly. And so even if it's our farm or another farm, we still maintain this wholesale price coming into our system. And that's the core of the, you know, that's the core thing of what we're doing is we're buying produce and delivering it. And we then look at, well, if we're going to make a good mix of produce and make a box that people like every week, and then we need to pack it and put it in a box and deliver it and, and pay for the acquisition costs and pay for the you know, customer service on top of it. You end up with this business model that says, well, if you want to make this much and we're not, you know, you need to price it here. And we've had, we have the benefit of having done this forever. So our pricing was really trial and error. I can't imagine how one would come up with a business model and price what we do without knowing exactly all the costs. So, if, so what's happened with our prices is over time they've evolved, you know, inflation and um, a big part of what we do is we only, you know, we really are like domestic produce only. We don't do Mexico. So the cost of as wages have gone up, um, price of farming and the state has gone up. Uh, we want to, we're very proud of the good jobs that we create you know, in the fields, in our warehouses, in our delivery systems. That all costs real money. And so we've just over time figured out what we need to charge to continue to do all that stuff. And we're always worried about being priced too high. But at the end of the day, we're not saying, hey, customer, we are going to scour the earth and find you the cheapest box of produce possible and deliver it to your door. Mm -hmm. We're saying, hey, potential customer, we have these values. We care about farming correctly. We care about taking care of the people that work for us. We care about delivering fresh, healthful food to your home. And this is not the cheapest thing, right? This is a quality product that costs mm -hmm. more money. And you need to trust us that we're going to do this, you know, do a good job at this. And we struggle with, you know, what we call churn. Of, of people trying us and not sticking. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, ongoing battle. Do you feel pressure, though, for to compare your prices to the grocery stores and maybe products from, from other, uh, other countries? Or, or do you just view it as, yeah, we're, 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 we are selling a direct competing product, but the value that people see in it is the local jobs, the freshness, um, and so they differentiate it that way. I mean, of course, we're comparing our prices to other stores. You know, I, I'm a, I use our service. I notice what things cost and mm -hmm. when I buy them from us or when I buy them from other places. It's just a human instinct to always notice that stuff. And I think we're very um, aware that it's a thing. And But at the end of the day, it costs a certain amount to deliver the service that we're delivering. And it's more money than, than when you're buying cheaper, cheap produce from anywhere and just getting in the box. How do you guys, I mean, you do the delivery, you bring it to the door, but you know, one of the things, not just buying local is the fact that I think some people think of a CSA as, as convenience, right? They know, um, they know it's just going to be there every week. They don't actually have to go to the grocery store and walk around with a cart and think about what vegetables do I need to buy? You know, you pretty much know you're getting what's in season because that's what shows up. So how, how much do you think that's actually a factor? I think that's a huge factor. And I, and I often, you know, I think about the grocery stores is they have a challenging task and the grocery stores are in the last hundred years of humanity. Supermarkets are without a doubt the biggest change in food in the food system in a good way, I think, but they have this, this challenge of like this expectation of always having everything for everyone all the time at the best prices. It's, it's an impossible, it's an impossible thing to do. And um, I think our story is, hey, we'll make it easy for you to support these values. Like eating with a local philosophy is easier said than done. We've all walked into the grocery store 
as soon as it feels a little warm outside and seeing the end cap of asparagus or whatever the thing is. And you're like, yes. And you're like, wait, that's from Chile. Oh, bummer. Like when is the local stuff really coming or what's, or what is the best local thing right now? And it's actually not an easy thing for anybody to do, but we have a team of buyers and farmers that that's all we do is we're just keeping track of that and making sure that as soon as the new thing, the new cool, exciting local thing is in, that that's what's featured in our boxes and available to our customers. And I think that's probably the one of the more important things that we provide our customers in addition to the making it easy for them to make that selection. They're really trusting us to do the hard work of staying tight to what's going on with the produce world and, and giving them a selection that no matter what they pick, they're meeting a set of values that they care about. So it's that curation service element that's, that I think, very important as well. Yeah, I think that. But it, the home delivery is an interesting one because it was a strange thing in the early 2000s, right? I, in the sure. 90s, they're you know, like, what? I'm like, yeah, we'll just take, we'll set on your doorstep. I'm like, wait, you're just going to leave food on my doorstep? Oh, like, yeah. And, you know, that's commonplace now. And it wasn't, um, mm-hmm. it wasn't a thing that everyone did. But I think the, the thing I appreciate most about the home delivery is, is during the, you know, the lockdowns. Our company was really providing a, a huge benefit to our customers. Like they already knew the routine. They already knew that it could be done. They knew how to, to, to place the order and that they could add things. And suddenly, you know, we hiccuped like everyone else but we're nimble enough and connected enough to the supply, which I can't, I just want to keep emphasizing, like people should be able to walk to their food source in a couple of days. Just think about if like the apocalypse happens, what are you going to do? Are you really, you know, counting on that ship of New Zealand apples to show up in the port and get unloaded on time? It's crazy. And we, we were so connected and close and our supply chain was just local enough that we were able to, to deliver a lot of good food to people that needed it. Yeah. What, what have you seen from that spike, of course, that you saw in 2000 to now? Do you, have you seen things level off? Did you go up there and kind of stay or how's that normalized yeah. for you? Yeah, we're following the trends, I think, of, of most retailers. You know, we had a bone did really well and have seen kind of a on a glide slope that we think is, you know, we think is leveling off. Um, we're certainly seeing indications it's leveling off and we're still signing up a lot of customers. Um, so that's where we are with it. Well, uh, so what's next for you guys? And uh, continue to expand the catalog, expanding areas that you guys are serving. Uh, what does the future hold? Yeah, I think, you know, the future for us is, is to do more of the same. I always joke that it was a great idea what our mom gave us, but we're actually not that original. <laughs> we're doing exactly what our parents did when we were little kids. Uh, we're just doing it better with all the tools and, you know, we take it really seriously. You know, when I look to the future, I, you know, I see a lot of challenges for local agriculture. I see and the food system in general. And so I, I think our place is to, is to continue to be the champions of, you know, the best quality local selection of it that's available and continue to remind people that this is important and, um, ultimately we need to keep our local growers in business. We can't, you know, I think it's the, the amount of fresh produce. I wish I had the statistic. I don't have it off the top of my head, but the amount of fresh produce produced in California is declining at a insane rate. And it's being driven by, you know, mainly the cost of labor and, you know, people, farmers are now switching to, things that could be harvested with machines. So we're seeing just all of these orchards, almonds, pistachios, walnuts, grapes, blueberries. Like that's what California agriculture is turning into or hay. And, you know, these things that you just drive around, you just drive through the field and you pick it. And that's not fresh food. You know, 90 plus percent of what we eat that's fresh produce is picked by a human being. There are some notable exceptions potatoes and things like that but generally speaking when you go into a produce department humans pick that stuff and i think we need to keep keep those people in california 
and that's a big challenge for our company or a big goal and, and thing that we're doing is we're still, you know, still supporting local farms. And if I could buy it for $10 from Mexico and we need to pay $20 because it's from California, that's not a debate we have in our company. That's just who we are. It's one of our values. And I don't, you know, I see that becoming more and more important as we move on. Well, Thad, uh, it's been a fun conversation and appreciate uh, all that you've shared, learning about your business and how you guys have grown. Um, if any of the listeners have questions about what we talked about today or want to learn more about, uh, you know, your brands, where, where can they go? Yeah, our websites are the best. Um, if you're in California, that's farmfreshtu.com. And if you're in the Pacific Northwest, that's um, fullcircle.com. And there'll be information there. And we'd really appreciate it if you check us out and give us a try. Well, well, again, Thad, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Love, love learning about your business and uh, best luck moving forward. Thank you. Really appreciate your time and great conversation. Mm-hmm.